today we'll continue our short series on discipleship, which is quite a big issue for us. We understand that this is an important part in Christ's vision of the church and in Christ's vision of our lives as Christians, as children of God. And we'll spend most of our time in uh, the book of Romans, epistle uh, um, to the Roman church, uh, chapter 15. So if you would uh, prepare your Bibles, open your Bibles, we'll, we'll go there. But before doing that, I would like to give you just a brief explanation how we got there. Uh, one of the most important things in our life is the great commission which Jesus gave or left to his disciples at the last day when he was on the earth. And before he ascended up to heaven, Jesus gathered his disciples and he gave them a very important commander, or we call it great commission. Uh, we find it in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, we read verse 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the, one of the most important passages in the, in the New Testament. And usually we associate it with something that Jesus had commanded us to do. And this is true. It is a commandment of Jesus. This is his will. He expresses that and he directs us. He points us that this is the way for Christians to, to live. But there's something much greater than just a, a commandment of something to do. This is actually Christ's description of our meaning of life. All of us are searching for the meaning. Uh, we live our lives and we want our lives to be spent for something worthy. We don't want to waste our lives. We are in search of our identity. We are in search of uh, uh, putting our efforts into something that would bring fruits, bring worthy results. And this is how we wired. We, this is how God made us. We are looking for that meaning all the time. And this is actually what Satan is using to direct people to a multi, uh, multitude of many different false hopes, false meetings. So we quite often direct our attention and direct our efforts into building something here on earth, achieving something great. There are many different things, and many of them are quite good, not, not bad, like uh, people are building houses or they're progressing in their art, and they're leaving something after them. They are creating some new products. They are achieving something good for humanity. And it looks like these are goals which are worthy to live for. But in reality, when we see what Jesus is saying here, we see that all of those earthly purposes, earthly meanings, they, are, they fall short of something really great. And the reason for that is that at one point of, of life here on earth, everything on earth, including the greatest achievements of human beings, will disintegrate, literally. Not just houses will just be in ruins, but actually every molecule, every atom of our or of, of matter will disintegrate into the smallest possible particles. And we read it in the Bible. Uh, Second Peter, the epistle of Apostle Peter, chapter 3, explains us that that will eventually happen. But when we are directed by Christ to reach out to people with the gospel of Christ and make disciples, 
and help them to grow into the knowledge of Christ, we are dealing with something which goes far beyond the earthly things. Something which is eternal, something which is beautiful, and something which is powerful enough that God had created the whole universe just for that purpose. And that powerful, eternal, and beautiful is human soul. And the church, which consists of saved souls. This is the reason why Jesus is saying, and we see here four important elements of this great commission. The number one is making disciples, which means that we are created, Jesus saved us, that we would live for the purpose of sharing the gospel and helping people to become learners, to become disciples of Jesus Christ. And the second thing that we see here is that uh, the first word, go, that word assumes an active position. It's not something that we are sitting and we are passively expecting the opportunities where we can make somebody a disciple or strengthening somebody else's faith. No, that involves if you want to have experience real meaning of life that Jesus brought into your life, go. Which, is me, which means proactively search for the opportunities where you could share the gospel, where you could point somebody to Jesus as Savior of our souls, where you can purposefully strengthen somebody else's faith. So if, if we do not have that proactive position, we'll never be able to, to discover the true meaning of life. That's, that's the central element of Great Commission. And then he brings two more, baptizing, which means that we, we are leading people to a certain level where baptism means that the person proclaims and declares to the people around him, to the spiritual world and to the people who live around them that I belong to Christ. So that, that, that means that we are making people disciples, not just at the level that they are interested in Jesus, but our purpose is to help them to grow in that interest that they would become committed disciples, which means that they testify that they are dying for themselves and they are raising up with Christ to live for Him, to live with His life inside of them. And number four here we see is, is another great element. Uh, look what, what he's saying here, uh, verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So Jesus is teaching us and our purpose throughout our lives. Everywhere where we, where we have uh, some kind of interaction with the people of God, our purpose is strengthen their faith, to help them to see Christ better to show them Christ's word, to, to point out to the practical aspect of trusting Christ in their lives. So this is a great commission, and it's actually described in details in many different epistles. And last sermon, if you remember, we, we focused on uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, where it's, uh, it's one of the best descriptions of, of our life in the church, we, we find it from verse 11, Ephesians 4 from verse 11. And he, meaning Jesus, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So there's a description how a church lives, that all pastors and teachers, they are working, they are equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, helping them to grow into maturity. And then the description, how it looks like, verse 14, so that we may no longer be children, so we are growing into maturity, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness of deceitful schemes, meaning the the whole system of satanic lies around us. Rather, speaking the truth in love, 
we are to grow up in every way into Him. So we are growing into Christ-likeness. We are being filled with Christ, that Christ was, would take over, take control over all our faculties, that He would be in our thoughts and our feelings and our reactions. So that's our, our purpose. And then verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is properly working, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So this is a description of the life of the church. So every joint and each part is working pro properly. There is a mutual, mutual interaction between parts of the body which is enriching. So this is actually the life of Christ. This is the, this is the meaning of life. This is what we call discipleship. And this is why we decided to spend several weeks to study that deeper and to learn from that that our lives would be enriched with such a, such a beauty and such powerful way of living which is presented here in the, in the Word of God. I will remind you again the definition of what, what we mean when we say discipleship. We'll bring it more and more just for us to get uh, saturated with it. So discipleship, in our context, how we use it, is the responsibility, and I would, hear, I would add here responsibility and privilege, is the responsibility and privilege of every believer to lead others to Christ, helping them to know Christ better, and trust Him more in practical aspects of life in the context of intentional, regular, and intimate relationship. And we will be talking about that more and more in, in our sermons. And actually, uh, tonight we will have our uh, third, I believe, third family service, which is dedicated to that. And we actually plan to have, I don't know if we would be able to do it tonight, but we will, we will plan to have uh, Q&As about how it's applied practically, how it's ex expressed in our lives. So that, that's an important element. So this is what the Lord has called us to do. Last time, we spent uh, the full sermon talking about number one condition which makes it possible. And that condition is love. True love, which came from God through Jesus Christ into our lives. You remember we spent the whole sermon uh, studying two verses from the Gospel of John, verse 13, uh, uh, chapter 13, verses uh, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are, are to love one another. And we described it and studied that, that we don't have power to love with real love. We like people who love us. This is human love. But real, heavenly love comes from heaven. It comes in Jesus. And when we are being filled with Jesus, with His thoughts, with His feelings, with His reactions, then we, we acquire that ability, the capacity to love people regardless of their attitude toward us. If you don't have that, you will fail to make disciples. You will fail to help others. You will do it at a certain point until they behave well. But sooner or later, every, every individual will fail you. Sooner or later, you will discover some bad qualities, bad character traits in everyone. So that's the re one of the key reasons why discipleship is not working often in the church. So the number one condition is the love of God which came to the earth in Jesus Christ and which is real for everyone who is in Christ. Today we'll speak about second condition which is no less important. And it's actually very practical, and it's, relate, it's, uh, it's related to every one of us. Actually, before doing that, I, I would like to point out to the definition of love that we, 
we brought last time. True love is caring for others. It's not just romantic feelings. It's not just butterflies in your stomach that you are just feeling love in the air. No, true love is caring for others and this love is born out of our humbly of ourselves and reverence for those around us. We respect people. We, we see them higher than we are. And that's, that's where love is being born, where the source of love. So, so true discipleship is, possibly, is possible only when we have this kind of love. So today we'll be talking about the second, uh, second condition, as this second condition is acceptance. I would like to... Uh, point you together or study together with you just one short verse. Romans 15, chapter, chapter 15, verse 7. And I took the actual title for my sermon directly from, from this verse. It's about one third of that verse. It's short verse. Accept one another. That's an important principle, important commandment that we find here. So discipleship requires heartfelt acceptance of each other. Accepting one another is a practical expression of love. So when we are speaking or thinking about the body of Christ, we are dealing with a very interesting phenomenon. The body of Christ consists of many different individuals. Some of us more mature, some less mature. Some of us have progress in certain areas of life, while others in this area are struggling. But they probably, or most likely, they have progress in different areas of life, where we are not so successful then we all have different backgrounds. And because of that, we have different tastes. We have different preferences. We all have different genes, different genetics. Quite often, we, we see that this, you see the son and, and you, you just recognize his father. I actually have a very interesting experience I just had last, uh, once again, actually, last Sunday. Uh, last Sunday, uh, we went with one of our deacons. We went to the uh, Salem Church, and they had a special celebration there. <clears throat> so uh, I was preaching there, and after the church, we have fellowship there. And there is one lady. She has her niece here in our church. And when I looked at her, she just reminds me her niece. She just acts like her. Uh, the way how she expresses herself, that's, that's just... And I see it's, it's not something that they spend time together and learn from each other. No, it's genes. This is, this is their, their genetics, their, how they are just programmed on the genetical level. So because of that, we are different. But that's how the body of Christ is built together. This is God's design. So we are different, and we, besides that, we all make mistakes. We sin. We have shortcomings. To one degree or another, we create problems for others. That's for sure. We're not looking forward to that. We want other people to create comfortable atmosphere around us in the environment. But we all, from time to time, more or less, we make other people uncomfortable. And that's how the body of Christ is built. So discipleship means helping one another with all of that reality, within all of that reality, helping to grow in Christ. Which means we first need to accept each other who we are. And this is what Jesus did when he was here on earth. There is a very interesting and clear illustration which you find 
through the whole Gospels, four Gospels, you, you, you can see it in the you know, four Gospels, you see how it, it's expressed. You know, Pharisees were, they knew the law very well, they knew scriptures. Many of them memorized it, and they could quote it by heart. But there was one huge problem within them. When they were teaching others, they were looking down at them. They put themselves on a higher level and they were just giving instructions. You behave this way, you behave this way, you have to be corrected, you have to be directed, you have to be prohibited or or something. This is how they lived. You probably remember when somebody wanted to teach you something good, but in such an attitude which kind of makes you not willing to learn in this kind of situation. So because of that, when Jesus came, he was completely different. You remember that he was just among other people. He was down to earth. He accepted those people into his life. And that actually became a point of judgment when Pharisees were judging Jesus for that. Uh, The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, we read verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Tax collectors were very bad people. They were actually legalized robbers. So they were robbing people, taking more than they were, charging people more, more, more than they supposed to do. So Pharisees were staying away from these people. And now they see Jesus eats with them. And in that culture, to eat together, it's something very important. It's meant that they were accepting each other. And Jesus is answering them. But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick go and learn what, what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is how Jesus described his acceptance. So by his attitude toward the people around him, Jesus demonstrated the way to practice discipleship and the atmosphere necessary for it to flourish. So we'll focus on that, and now we come to the book of Romans. And we we will study the verse 7 and chapter 15, but before we do that, let's go to chapter 14 to discover the greater context where it is um, written. Chapter 14, we start with verse 6. The one who observes the day observes it in, in, in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in the honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Look what he is saying here. You remember that most of those people, he, they came either from the Jewish background or from Gentile background. They brought their subculture or their background culture with them. Like Jewish people, they were... It was wired within them to celebrate Jewish uh, feasts, different feasts. And there was a kind of disagreement which sometimes turned into arguments and sometimes turned into divisions between those people. So Paul is explaining here, and he said that the motivation is much more important than tradition. And he is saying... It is for the Lord, in honor of the Lord. Several months ago, during the summer camp, several of our groups, home groups, they, they were together at the lake here. And they asked uh, us to come, and I spent the day that they are just, just going through some scriptures. And one of the men at that camp asked me, how far are we as a church willing to to go beyond our Russian traditions. And when, when we'll do that? And I ask him one very important question. For what purpose? And that's the main thing. Look what he's saying here. 
It is in the honor, in honor of the Lord. So when a person lives and he wants to serve the Lord, he wants to submit to the Lord, he wants to honor the Lord, then traditions are nothing. Then traditions should not hold us. But the most important reason that we are being driven by desire to satisfy the Lord, to please Him, to do something that He wants to do, and if something holds me up, I oh, no, I will step over it. I will break it down. I will do whatever is necessary to honor the Lord. This is what Paul is writing here. And then he goes on in verse uh, 8. He says, For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whenever we live or whether, whether we die, we are the Lord's. Then in verse 15, he continues on with the same thought. And he says, For if, you brother is, if your brother is grieving by what you eat, meaning, meaning those, uh, you remember, uh, those uh, uh, rules which related to diet, uh, the, uh, the diet which was part of the Mosaic law. He's saying, if you are no longer walking in love, uh, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So he says, and then if you just want to break certain traditions just because of tradition, just, just be careful. Be careful because you can damage somebody else, people around you. So do not let what, uh, verse 16, do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, so no diets, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by man. So then let us pursue what makes peace and for mutual upbuilding. And this is a key word. We'll focus on that word next sermon, Lord willing. That's actually the key element of discipleship, a building of others. Or there's another word, edifying others. For that purpose, I decided to give you a definition of this word or translation. This word comes from the word oikos. And maybe you heard that word. If you had been around the Christian world, you had, had heard that word oikos. Oikos mean, means house or household. And here we see word, the word oikodemais, which is a, a, a verb coming out of that root which actually translated the act of building, building up. In the New Testament, metaphorically, it's translated as edifying, edification, the act of one who promotes others' growth in Christian wisdom, piety, holiness, and happiness. So that's the key element. We are living not just make people happy. We are living, our purpose is to strengthen those people in Christ. Strengthen their trust in Christ. Their faith in Christ. This is the key element of discipleship. And then he continues on that thought. And in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, we read, we who are strong have no obligation to have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. That's a very interesting thing. We live in a therapeutic society. We live in a world where everything should please us. We have to have a car which is most comfortable. We'll bring coffee. Uh, we'll drink coffee only with the base, best taste. Uh, the, recently I read, I read a saying that life is too short for bad coffee. That's truly the highest level of, you know, the value in life. I mean that the whole life is, is just to have best coffee. And this is the mentality. Best coffee, best car, best climate, uh, best job, dream job, best, 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 everything. But what he's here, he's saying here, is not the Christian attitude. 
And by the way, there is nothing bad in good coffee. And there are, there are many good coffee. You can find many good ways. But that's not what determines our life. Uh, it is better with no coffee at all. But with what is here. Let each of us please his neighbor to his good. To build him or her up. And before that, and do not please ourselves. So this is, and it was even then. Not just now, it was even then. Because it's a part of our, it's part of our nature. And he's, he's saying, look, it is much, much better. If you will focus instead of pleasing yourself. Focus on, on the ways, finding the ways. How you can build up a person next to you. And in order to do that, in order to do that, friends, we need true love and we need acceptance. And now we come to this very short but very rich word, uh, verse. Wherefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. So please forgive me for a long introduction. But it was still an introduction, about 30 minutes now. And I, I hope that we will just go really quickly, but it's a very important te uh, text. It's a very important verse. We find here several reasons and several ways how to accept each other in this short verse. Number one, accepting one another actually becomes possible only because of the nature of salvation. The nature of salvation is the reason for accepting one another. So Romans 15, 7, we read, Wherefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us. We are quoting NASB here. NASB is New American Standard Bible. It's one of the translations, versions of the translation. So most of you are using ESV, probably. This is what we have in Pew Bibles here. And it's very good if you would open your Bible is best, but if you don't have your Bible, open Pew Bible, just that you may see it, that you may interact with the text. So in the ESV, it would be written here, wherefore, welcome one another. And these two words, they complement each other. Uh, you could put it together, accept welcoming one another. So that's the purpose which Paul is writing here. But he is saying that accept one another in the same way just as Christ also accepted us. Salvation through Christ is unique. It differs from any other religion. Moreover, this is the only one way to be saved. So the way how Christ saved us from power of sin, from eternal punishment, he did it not because of our some kind of good deeds or some achievements or something good within us. The only reason why Christ saved us is his eternal, absolutely unexplainable by us love toward us. The scripture calls this grace. And when we see how Christ saved us, we see several important elements, which I will just point out very quickly, that we would, that we would know how Christ saved us, that we, how Christ accepted us, then we will know how to accept other people. Number one, we're saved not by our merits. We're saved by grace. Jesus came to the earth, and he's saving us, he's saving you, he's saving me, not because I have achieved something. He does not look toward the people around and he, say, he says, here, oh, look, Jeff, oh, this is very good. Yeah, let's say, oh, Daryl, he's even better. Yeah, let's save those good guys. No, he is looking and he says, oh, there's Alexei, nothing good in him. 
But what he's doing, the only way he's saving us is just because of what, who he is, not who, he, who we are. Every one of us. If you look at us, You'll find so many difficulties, so many shortcomings, so many problems within us. We are not savable. We're not likable. But He is saving us, saving us, not because of our merits. Ephesians 2, the greatest explanation of grace but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we are we were dead in our trans transgressions made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in, G in Christ Jesus well, that's a very important element of our salvation. And friends, we need to understand that we need to be rooted in grace for several reasons. Number one, reason number one, you know that salvation by grace is our assurance of salvation. If we would be uh, relying on something that we achieved, first of all, we will, be, we will never be able to have that, that foundation because because all the time, if you're honest, you have a lot of things in our life that you fail. There, there's no way to be saved. And actually, our assurance of salvation lies upon what Christ did for us because of Him, not because of me. Second, salvation by grace is our hope and joy. You know, we feel good when we behaved well when we achieved something, when we did something and we, have, uh, we see good results, when people around us, they recognize it and they, they are willing to be part of that. And, but uh, when we focus on our thoughts upon Christ, we will find much greater source of our satisfaction, joy and peace in our heart. This is what, who He is. That this is what, who, uh, what he has done and what he is continuing doing for us. But number three, we see that salvation by grace is our strength to accept others who are saved. So when, we, when you experience grace, you remember that you, are, you have been accepted only because of grace to so accept others for the same reason. You see someone who is not worthy? You see someone who would, you would rather to just go around? You see someone who is not comfortable? Who creates some kind of difficulties because who she or he is? You remember that this is a place where, where we have an opportunity to, to express grace. The grace of heaven, the grace of God, which had been expressed, expressed through Christ. And this is what we see. This is the key element of salvation. This is why we, we remember the gospel. We remember the cross all the time. In 1 Corinthians, we read in chapter 4 a very interesting reminder. And this reminder shows us that we, we are prone to forget it. Verse 6, now these things, brethren, I have figured to apply to myself in an Apollos for your sakes, that in, in us you might learn not to exceed what is written, in order that no one of you might become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. It's a very interesting thing, which happens. You know, we're all prone to, to behave like Pharisees. When we come to Christ, we came by grace. We came understanding that the only reason why we are saved is because of Christ. I have nothing to boast. But after time passes by, we discover that we are better than other believers. In this area and in that area, and those are, they are just, just probably not too good in something. And we become like that, become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. Verse 7, for who regards uh, you as superior? 
And what do you have that you did not receive? And that's a very important thing. All our achievements is a result of grace. And we need to remember that. If you had done great things for the Lord, it's just because of grace. If you, if Lord gave you ability to, to overcome certain weaknesses and difficulties in life, it's, it's not something that you boasting with. It's something that God gave you mercy, His grace. And then he continues at the end of this verse, but if you did receive it, why do you boast as you have not received it? So there is a problem, and because of that, Paul is warning uh, that, that we, we should be very careful. Uh, Romans 14, chapter 1, verses 1 and 3. Now, accept one who is weak in faith, but, do not for the per- but, uh, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions, one man has faith that he may eat all things, meaning things which had been prohibited by Mosaic law. But he who is weak eats vegetables only. Let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat, and, not let, uh, and let not him who does, does not eat judge him who eats. For God has accepted him. So this is a very important thing. We are saved by grace, we will show grace to our brothers and sisters just as we are saved by Christ, accepting them just as Christ accepted them also. Number two, when we see the nature of salvation, there are four things that we need, need to remember. How nature of salvation helps us to accept others. First, we are saved by grace, and because of that, we have to accept others by, by grace. Number two, we are saved forever. You know the situations where you had accepted someone and you feel like friends uh, in Russia, we say, in Russian, we say, it's like uh, you cannot separate them. But then time, time passes by and you see something that it's kind of cools off and people are farther and farther and then they are not willing even to see each other. But this is not what happened with Christ. Try to remember your life. Remember the day when you came to Christ. For some of you, it could be decades ago. And try to remember all the time from that time to now and remember how often you were sliding back forgetting Christ, living for your passions, acting as you are not Christian. But Christ continues to accept you. You are still his brother or his sister. Time passes by, and you're not all the time faithful, but he is. This is what it means, accept one another, just as Christ accepted you. Forever. Hebrews 10, verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And this is because of the covenant, new covenant. It it is resting on the new covenant. On something which is made between God the Father and between God the Son, and we are part of that. Romans 8, we remember, uh, verses 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. When you see your brother and sister or sister sinning, when you see someone is not acting in the best way, what feelings do you have inside of you? Sometimes we are detaching from them. Quite often we are judging them. But what Jesus is doing at that point, He's interceding. When he sees you, my brother or my sister, when he sees you failing, you know what he's doing? 
He does not have bad feelings over us. He comes to the Father, and He intercedes, and He asks, Father, I died for this person. Let's pull him or her out. He is dear to me. I paid my blood for him. This is the feeling that we should have toward those who are failing. This is what it means, accepting others as Christ accepted us. Number three, we are saved completely. That's a very interesting thing. You know, when when Jesus saved us, he did not say, all right, you know, there is probation time. You are saved. You are almost there, but let's look how you behave. Let's see how how it would work first year or first 10 years. If you behave well, then I may show you to my angels. You're good enough, and I can... uh, I can bring you into the heavenly. And if you behave really, really well, then I can introduce you to my father. This is completely, completely not what Jesus did. And it's because our salvation rests not upon us, but upon him. Look what he is, uh, he is saying here. It's a very interesting. Ephesians 1.11. In him we have obtained an inheritance. You know what inheritance means? It's something what God the Father has prepared for for His Son. And in Him, He gives us everything that what He had prepared for the Son. Hebrews 2.11, this is a very interesting verse. Look, Look with me. For He who sanctifies, meaning God the Father, and those who are sanctified all have won the or the, I mean the, the Christ and the whole who are sanctified, me us, all have one source, meaning the Father and Holy Spirit. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. That's a very interesting thing. When I read this verse, I remember situations, and you probably had those situations. Do you have relatives that you are kind of uncomfortable with? You are a bit ashamed of them. And here they are. They are coming and into your circle, and they are, they are getting close to you, just emphasizing that I am his relative. And you are trying to stay away from him as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, he is my relative, but not so close. Yeah, maybe, but we, we don't have much in common with him. But look what Jesus is saying. He is not ashamed to call you brother and sister. And there are friends, there are many things for Jesus to be ashamed of us. Just remember your thoughts last week. Just remember your unforgiving spirit. Just remember your lust. Just remember your lack of love. And Jesus takes you and me and brings us to his Father. And he stands next to us and he says, he is my brother. I died for him. He, she is my sister. I paid my life for her. This is what it means. Accept one another. It's not because who we are. And because of, it's because of who he is. Romans 8, we, we read again about us being co-heirs with, uh, with Jesus. Uh, if you would read verses uh, 16, The Spirit himself bear witness within our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer, suffer with him. Ephesians 4, another interesting example, verse 31, 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you um, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. In what way? As God in Christ forgave you. Colossians 3, verses uh, 12 and 13. 
Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against other, uh, against other, another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. It's a very interesting thing here. Look what he is saying, that uh, uh, you are chosen, God's chosen, holy and beloved, and because of your holiness, have compassion and hearts, have kindness, have humility. That's an interesting expression. And the last one. So when we are thinking about nature of salvation and how it determines us accepting others, we see that we are saved not by our merits. We are saved forever. We are saved completely made, made in uh, co-heirs with Christ. And we are saved because of Christ's sacrifice. Just short, short explanation of what it means. For Jesus to accept us, he had to put himself in a very uncomfortable position. He actually had to sacrifice to accept us. It's not something that brought a lot, became easy for him. No, it's, it's not. First Peter 2.21 for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his, his steps. Another very interesting passage, I see the time runs out, but, but I need to point out to that uh, Gospel of John 15, 15. It's a very interesting thing. It's a practical example, what Jesus, how Jesus accepted his, his disciples. You remember that it happens probably about two hours before his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that he asked those disciples to pray with me, be with me, and they failed. You, you remember that they fell asleep. And in another couple of hours, they all ran away, leaving him, one against the whole army of military who came to torture him. And now four hours, six hours before that happens, look what he is saying to his disciples. John 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants, but uh, for the servants does not, servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. That's a very interesting thing. Jesus is saying, they are my friends. You are my friends. Nowadays, we have a lot of talks about what is true friendship. This is what is true friendship. He knows they will fail him, but he is their friend. And he accepts them as friends. And this is an example of what we have in Jesus. So Romans 15, 7, once again, wherefore accept one another just as Christ also accepted us. This is the key element that we see here in this passage. Two more before we will pray, and I will try to be as short as, as possible. Uh, second, what we see in this passage is the nature of the church creates an environment of mutual acceptance. So we accept each other just because this is how Christ saved us. But when he saved us, he saved us into the church, and church does not have any other condition as to be accepting each other. Therefore, accept one another. And I want you to, uh, to focus on these two words, one another. Who are those one another's? Those special people. Romans 12, 4 and 5. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members for one another. Ephesians 4, 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We cannot get, get away from each other. We are different. 
We're different in our spiritual development. But we are part of one another. We are united in the body of Christ. In the 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, 1 Corinthians, we read several very important comparisons which help us to understand this reality. We start with verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So he points to two main divisions which we are part of the, their life at that time. Jews and Greeks. They were incompatible. Then social divide, slaves and masters. And we have many other divisions. But he is saying that all of us are made part of one body, the same body. You know what makes all members of the body belonging to the same body, what makes them one? DNA. DNA is a, is a certain, certain signature in every cell. There are many different cells. Just look up to your body. Look, uh, there are nails, it's certain cells. See your skin, different cells. Your brain, different cells. Your blood, different cells. Your bones, different cells. All of them are different, but all of them share the same DNA. And that makes them one. And they're related to one body. And they're controlled by one nervous system. And they serve one purpose. That's what, what Paul is explaining to us. And then we, we continue on. Uh, let's uh, read verse 22 in chapter 12. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, lacked it that, that, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care of one another. This is the key expression, same care of one another. So we were discussing already two things. We, we were saying that our... A relationship to one another, accepting one another, is coming out of the nature of our salvation, then it is absolutely real and we cannot, we cannot go over it, we cannot avoid it because of the nature of the church. And number three, the nature of life in Christ is the catalyst of mutual acceptance. It helps us. The more we have life of Christ, to the greater degree will accept one another. Wherefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us. And look at the last portion of that word, to the glory of God. How does, this, does it happen? Scriptures say that by imitating Christ and accepting one another, we manifest the beauty and majesty of His character. And we have that privilege to express it in practical aspects of our lives. Romans 15, 5, Now may, may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look how we glorified God the Father when we are in harmony in one accord. Therefore accept one another. Uh, then we, we go to the uh, Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3. It's the same thing. Bearing with one another in love. So this is the expression, how we express the character of Christ. Ephesians 5 speaks about our being filled with the Spirit. How we are build, when we are being be, uh, filled with the Spirit, we address one another or edify one another. We sing and making melodies to the Lord. We give thanks always and for everything. So before we conclude, 
I would like to make a short definition of what it means to accept one another. To accept one another is to consider everyone who has been saved as dear and close family members in Christ Jesus, regardless of their shortcomings, level of maturity, so that by showing them sincere love and care, without exaltation or condemnation, you help them sacrificially and patiently to strengthen their trust in Christ in the practical matters of life. So this is what it means to accept one another, which is very clearly part of the discipleship that we are talking about. We'll pray now. And as you know how we do it, we, we kneel down just to express our submission to the Lord. And I want you to take some time and just to spend between you and the Lord and thanking Lord that discipleship is the main purpose and main meaning of life. Just come to Him and recognize that to lead people to faith in Christ and to establish them in it, it is necessary to be driven by the love of Jesus Christ. And then edification of souls in Jesus Christ is possible, impossible without heartfelt acceptance of them. And the last one, the acceptance of one another is connected to the nature of salvation, nature of the church, and nature of Christ's life in us. Let's think about that and meditate in prayer before the Lord. Let's kneel down and spend some time in prayerful meditation. Our Lord God, our merciful Father, we come before you with the understanding that only because of your love, your grace, because of the sacrifice of your Son, we are able to call you Father. Lord, thank you for making us part of your heavenly family. Thank you, Lord, for saving us, not because of our merits, but because of who you are. Thank you for your righteousness. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this grace to get more and more rooted in grace. Lord, we understand that we belong to you, and now we want... And we want to ask you that this grace that had been instrumental in our lives in saving us would become an instrument of our attitude toward others. Lord, help us to accept other brothers and sisters. Help us, Lord, to have your attitude toward them. Help us, Lord, to edify them, to strengthen them in following you, that we would be your instrument, that you will, we will be conduits of your saving love and saving grace, that you would use us to save people, to strengthen them, to help them to express you more, to make people more beautiful in you, and to express your majesty and your greatness, and Lord, we depend on you, and we want to, to learn that. We want to practice that in our lives, in our families, in between each other here in the church, in our small groups, in different uh, circumstances where we are. We know, Lord, that we can trust you, and we put our hope upon you, that, that we will be strengthened by you, and we would be... Uh, and disciples for others and disciples of others. We ask you, Lord, about all of that in the name of our Jesus, who is Lord who died for us, who gave his righteousness to us, and now we rejoice in him in Jesus' name. Amen.